The proceeding will start shortly. Order, order. Welcome to this Defence Select Committee hearing on Tuesday the 24th of January 2023, where we'll be looking at uh, defence and climate change. And I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Stuart Parkinson, who's the Executive Director, Scientist for Global Responsibility, and Lindsay Cottrell, who's the Environment Policy Officer at Conflict and Environment Observatory. Can I welcome you both this morning? Very grateful for you uh, taking your time out uh, to talk to us. A um, number of questions that we're going to be looking at from uh, Defence's challenge in measuring and reporting and setting targets for, for climate change, but also looking at the ability, uh, given uh, the military's main objective is to uh, provide defence on how they can actually reduce their own emissions as well. So thanks very much indeed. Could I ask uh, John Speller to kick us off? John. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And, uh, so a general question to start off with, what are the, would you say, are the principal climate change issues for UK defence and security? Okay, um, I think there are, there are two broad issues that I want to briefly touch on at the start. Um, one is greenhouse gas emissions themselves and one is the impacts of climate change. Um, so the world and indeed the UK are not reducing greenhouse gas emissions nearly fast enough. Um, we're back for about 2.7 degrees of global temperature rise and even more um, if tipping points, if climate tipping points are, are passed. Um, and so within this, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, militaries are large greenhouse gas emit uh, emitters um, and have in general been quite slow in taking action in this area. Um, we published a report last year where we estimated the carbon footprint of the world's militaries to be about 5.5% of global emissions. Um, and while there's a lot of uncertainty around that, the data is not good as we will discuss. Um, it gives you an idea of the scale of the problem. I mean, that those emissions are larger than the Russian carbon footprint, for example. Um, and where, and so prim in where primarily do they, do they come from? Have you disaggregated that at all? We, we have tried to. I mean, there's a lot around fuel use. There's a lot around supply chain. Um, there's a very uncertain amount around the impacts of emissions. So um, those are kind of the main categories. So sorry, I'll just interject there. Um, so that 5.5 estimate is just based on military kind of day-to-day -day activities. Oh. So that actually isn't including the impacts from actually fighting a conflict as well. But how's that disaggregated between the different arms of the services, in your estimate, even if it's rough? Um, are you talking between Army, Navy, military, for example? Army, Navy, Air Force, for example. Uh, so, sorry, Army, Navy, Air Force. Um, that, that is difficult to tell um, with the data that's available. The Air Force, if, if like in Britain, we have a sizable air, air force, then that will be the dominant service. Um, uh, but again, we have a large navy, so that would be large. But in somewhere like Germany, the army is um, a, a bigger emitter or a bigger fraction. <coughs> so, yeah. Lindsay, um, anything to okay. add to that? Um, I wanted to briefly add yes. I mean, I, but there were two implications that I just wanted to draw out of what I was saying about greenhouse gas emissions. One is is obviously what we're going to be talking about today is the military taking more action to reduce its own emissions. But also there's an issue around military communication, particularly to central government, um, about the increased security risks if we do not reduce emissions faster. And, and I think that needs to be yet heard more loudly in central government that this is a priority issue, this is a essential issue. Um, we shouldn't uh, despite everything that's going on in the world, we shouldn't put this on the back burner. Um, and, and the key reason for that is climate change impacts, and we're already starting to feel that through extreme weather, and militaries are being called in to help in, in emergency situations. Um, and, yeah, some of the implications of that around the military itself needing to adapt, although we're not going to talk about that today. 
but there's also an implication again around civilian agencies being strengthened so that the militaries are, are used less for those, those tasks so again a, a message from um, military sources about strengthening civilian agencies would would be good to to hear more Lindsay, have you got anything to add um, yeah, I think I'll probably probably just reiterate about um, the kind of concern with respect to um, the current political tensions and the kind of pressures on reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions for the military. And obviously, um, that will seem possibly as a, as a low priority because of the other um, military priorities at the moment. But of course, with all this increased expenditure, um, there's the Going to, that's going to lead to further greenhouse gas emissions and this isn't going to go away you know the pressures on the environment remain um, just this month actually the world economic forum issued their latest global risks report for um, 2022 um, sorry for 2023 and the same as last year all the top risks global risks are all, are all environmental so that's um, failing to mitigate with respect to climate change failing to um, adapt and biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse yeah, and your geopolitical so tensions are, are down at around about tenth compared to the <coughs> environmental you know this is over the next 10 years it's, you know we've got to look long term we haven't got to just think about the short-term political risks with respect to Ukraine so you know it must be kept there as a priority even despite the need the you know the fact that governments are increasing their um, military expenditure Okay. And what I say, I say sorry, <laughs> um, and also the way the fo you know the focus is changing because a lot of the talk um, has been around climate security. So talking about how the military may need to um, think about how conflicts are uh, um, generate differently because of all the um, risks of climate change causing greater impact on um, resources, people moving, and all the um, risks of increased conflict and how and where wars will be fought. You know, but as obviously, you know, our focus is actually the fact that the military contributes such a large amount of those emissions, so they, they need to be tackled. It's not just about climate security and the military adapting and adapting its assets. It's actually the military reducing its emissions. That's what's the key importance to us. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, th thank you. Just exploring that a bit further, Lindsay, just because you, you, you do raise it. Um, some of the news that came out of COP27 was quite grim. We're, we're not meeting the targets. We're not able to perhaps change the direction of travel uh, of us harming our fragile planet. Are, are you concerned that in the next, uh, what, what, sorry, turn that around. What time scale do you think we will start to see uh, genuine, uh, the, the scale of climate change impacting potentially on areas like Africa, which will then cause um, uh, larger scale disturbances in security uh, in the economy that would then warrant uh, a concern for armed forces? Um, well, I, I think it's very difficult to link directly how conflict, um, you know, conflict and climate change. We already know that climate change is causing um, big effects in Africa. You know, we've got extreme weather events, we've got environmental degradation already. Um, we've already had, you know, 40 major conflicts um, this century. Um, you know, that link is irrespective of whether conflicts, um, climate change, cause conflicts or not. We need to to know how adapt, how the military must um, contribute to reducing its influence on that. From our point of view, well, I don't um, disagree with that. My my question <clears throat> is, do we need to qualify and recognise that the fact that climate change is now contributing to greater insecurity when we, for example, uh, address our refresh of the integrated review, so our defence posture, are we factoring in enough the impact of climate change on global international security? Um, I, I, I'm not really in a position to say that because that's not my focus and area of work. I don't know whether um, Stuart's got a point Yeah, I'd, no. I would like to try and answer that. Yes, I think the security issues are growing, but there are a wide range of ways in which you deal with those security issues, those climate security issues. Um, and the importance of not skimping on overseas development aid, which can help with strengthening governance so that, that countries do not 
descend into um, into major problems. Um, strengthening, um, yeah, poverty alleviation. So there are not so many people at risk when um, climate disasters happen. Um, and, and also the importance of diplomacy and, and mediation and, and um, Britain getting involved in, in mediating between conflicts. Um, and so those, there are many other steps to, that need to be taken, need to be supported to tackle climate change before you get to um, military involvement. And I, I think often those aren't given enough priority. So that's where I would focus um, the extra resources in, in tackling the climate risks that we are starting to see on, on a year-to-year -year basis. Okay, thank you for that. Richard. Um, good afternoon to you both. Um, what particular challenges do armed forces face in measuring, reporting and setting targets to reduce military defence? Doctor. <clears throat> um, can I pass this one to Lynn? With, with, we'd agreed she would answer this first and then I would add some material. Well, Lindsay to go first, yes? Yeah. Right. Over to you, Lindsay. Okay. Um, so, um, well, overall, um, obviously the MOD is not dissimilar to other very, very large organisations and bodies. Um, there are large organisations who are already tackling this, but, you know, we appreciate that the MOD is extremely complex, um, its structure, and also it's got a very large and complex supply chain, which makes it very difficult. Um, also, for the MOD, um, you've got responsibilities across the different top-level budget organisations, of course, you know, across the Navy, our Air Force, our, um, Army, um, strategic demand, demand and um, equipment and defence infrastructure organisations, etc. Um, and I think, you know, that means, you know, where, where does the lead come from and how coordinated is that response? And is there enough um, cooperation and collaboration across the whole organization to achieve this? <laughs> and also kind of identifying like budget commitments. Um, and, and critically, I think, is, 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 is the resourcing in place within the MOD um, to, to allocate and provide mm -hmm. the spe specialty specialisms and skill sets that are needed to actually deliver this within the MOD itself. Um, another thing as well is kind of like this kind of the overall auditing within MOD and the verification of their own data sets. Um, I was looking at some of the Defence um, Safety Authority annual reports um, and they've kind of identified this um, kind of lack of resourcing on the environmental protection side. Um, and so it's just kind of emphasising that need that they need these resources to be able to deliver these policies that have been put in place. Um, Last year, I think it was, yeah, in April last year, um, the Defence Environmental um, Protection Regulator was set up. Um, now, I'm not sure what the remit of that regulator is, um, whether that also includes, because it's looking at the third party assurance processing reporting across MOD of environmental reporting, but whether that's going to include the kind of greenhouse gas emission reporting requirements as well. I'm not too clear about that yet because I haven't been able to find kind of a, an overview of what their remit will be. So um, I think that would be incredibly important and useful for their, that remit to cover it, and hopefully it will do. Um, another big problem for the MOD, and um, I think you touched upon this, um, you know, we were talking about when we, when we looked at the global emission estimates for the military of this 5.5, and um, that was kind of like estimating all the kind of um, direct and indirect emissions of the military's activities. Um, so that's, um, I don't know if you're familiar with scope one, two and three with respect to greenhouse gas emission reporting. But then there's this whole other category of scope three plus, which we call it, is, is all the other indirect emissions which are linked to fighting a war itself. So this might be to do with um, landscape fires, um, reconstruction costs, all the debris management that's needed when a, um, after a conflict's happened. And, you know, at the moment, there's, you know, how on earth are those scope three plus indirect emissions looked at? They're not looked at yet. Um, so that's, we, we've kind of developed some kind of framework to do that, but we know that there's a lot more research needed to support militaries to actually do that kind of reporting as well, because it's all important to understand what the whole carbon footprint of the military activities is. Um, and then the other thing, sorry, I've got quite a big long list. 
Um, another thing is um, independent verification. So, um, you know, this all risk of you've heard the freight greenwashing um, across other organisations, and it can same be true um, um, potentially of um, green um, for the for, excuse me for the military as well. Um, if it's providing data, you know, how can that be independently verified from an ex from an external assurance point of view? And that I think would be really important to take that forward. How that can be done as well. Um, and I'll pass over to, to Stuart now. <laughs> I have got some other things, but just so you've got a chance to say something too. Right, okay, well, I'll, I'll add a few things at this point. Um, I think on the measuring and reporting side, there is there is a historical weakness there because of the UN Climate Convention. Um, there were a number of exemptions agreed in 1997 for reporting of military emissions, um, and it meant that a lot of the data is either not counted or is hidden within civilian categories. And, and that sort of um, issue um, needs to be dealt with and, and has led to a lot of um, or experience within militaries in, in being able to count emissions effectively and reliably and in, in a standardized way um, comparable with other sectors. Um, so that's a particular problem. I mean, there are national security issues, but I think those are slowly being overcome. And um, and as we will come on to with the what data the UK military publishes, um, it publishes a lot more than, than many other militaries, which kind of shows that a lot of the national security concerns are, are being overcome. Um, and another issue is around supply chain um, estimations um, of emissions. Um, and these are complex and, and many organizations are, are st still developing methodologies to calculate these um, and the um, militaries and, and the MOD um, will need to look at that um, and that's that's a big part of the carbon footprint that I was talking about earlier. Um, the, the knowledge at the moment is, is very limited in this area and I keep reading um, um, when people refer to carbon footprints they often Often don't refer to carbon footprints, uh, and they're using the terminology mistakenly. So um, there, there's a lot of stuff there. And then on target setting, I could move on to that. Um, I mean, the, the the experience in the MOD has been using the green and government commitments as a basis for setting targets, which is is a good start. But those have only been in, on greenhouse gas emissions. So um, have only. Um, being related to the estate emissions and not on military equipment, military capability. Um, and so, and they haven't been subject to, to any targets to date or, or any um, absolute overarching targets. So that's, that's an issue there. Um, and then um, on a couple of other areas, um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, there, there's a, there's an issue between um, and in a potential incompatibility. I mean, we're going to come and go on to talk about this in, in particular reference to the MOD, but um, an incompatibility to what is measured and what emissions are measured and what emissions are um, that the targets are set for. Because if you're measuring a different category than you're setting a target for, and that incompatibility means you, you can't actually track how well you're doing, and we're, we're seeing problems of that nature. Right, okay, thank you very much. Chairman. Richard, thank you. Uh, Gavin Robinson. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Dr. Parkinson, I wonder if I could just I get a sense with some of the um, questions and answers here, we're going to have a bit of seepage from one area uh, mm. to another, given the nature of, uh, of the questions that we have for you. But can I just pick up on the 1997 UN agreement that you referred to um, around yeah. measuring and reporting? And have you got a, a compare and contrast as to what was agreed then with the associated exemptions and what mm -hmm. MOD does today? Do MOD measure and report more, less, or in keeping with what was agreed in 1997? Well, this is where it gets complicated. The MOD reports both. So there are within the data that the UK government reports as a whole to the UN um, Climate Agency, 
Um, there is a, a reporting framework which has some categories that include some military emissions. The MOD, in, in collaboration with um, the other government st climate statisticians, um, provide data in this reporting format. Then the MOD does a separate report, um, and currently this is published in the annual report and accounts. Um, and that has a separate set of data of what its emissions are. And the, that statement is much more in depth um, than the statement to the, the UN Climate Convention. So one of our arguments in general is, is that the, we need more openness at a UN level so that we can see much more of the data that militaries are responsible for internationally. Um, and, and some push from the UK government, the UK military on this um, through either the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or through the conference parties systems would be very, very helpful. So if I take from that, you're saying that MOD publish additional materials separately, which you're now using as a sort of benchmark yep. and encouraging others to, to do similarly. Maybe, uh, yep. I'm not sure, um, Ms. Cottrell, whether you have a a view on this or not, but are the MOD in uh, publishing additional information, publishing information which is additional to other countries who are doing so? Um, yes, they are. Yes. Yeah. And, and are yes. other countries noticing? Or are, are others, like your contemporaries in other countries, advocating similar additional publication in their nations and using the UK as a benchmark? Or, or is it something that is becoming standardised? Well, this is exactly what we're trying to advocate for. Um, so we've been looking at this kind of, we call it this um, military emissions gap. So what is required to be submitted to, well, what the um, UN ask of um, countries with respect to their military data, but they only have to provide it voluntary. So it doesn't have to be disaggregated. So um, looking at, so, so there's about 40 or so countries which are required to submit this data um, on military, and it's just on military fuel use, so it's just one aspect of military emissions. Um, so that only counts for, it doesn't count for all the emissions at all, it's just looking at fuel use. So less than half of the countries um, are providing that good quality disaggregated data. <coughs> uh, they're just providing a bit of it, and it's just kind of messed up with all the other, mixed up with all the other um, reporting for the country. So it's this is why this kind of global emission estimate is so difficult to do because the data is not there to do it. And because the UK government are doing better than a lot of other countries, this is what we want to do and get the UK government to advocate for other militaries to do the same because it's so important, because we know the contribution is so large that we get to a much better understand and more countries recognise the need to um, keep a check on what their military emissions are so they can manage and account for them and see how they sit within their country's carbon budgets. Okay, thank you. I'll pass back to the Chair. I think Mr Francois has some further questions. On yes. Mark. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Um, last week the committee visited RAF Marham and we told them in advance that we were interested amongst other things as well as the operational side in the use of the sustainability of aviation fuel. There must have been a slightly cross wire somewhere but because we didn't get any information on that. We came back none the wiser, but we got an extensive briefing on the use of plant-based substitutes in food. At one point, we thought we weren't at a military establishment. We were in the middle of an episode of MasterChef. So, um, Dr. Parkinson, could you, can you say anything about fuel particularly? As that is the greatest component of uh, the MOD's contribution to, to, to climate change. What information... And, and measurement to the ministry have specifically of fuel emissions and particularly in terms of aviation, but also if you could touch, for instance, on ships and armoured vehicles, if there's any data on that too. The, the MOD does publish data on its use of aviation fuel um, and it uses that as a basis for its estimate of um, its um, total carbon emissions. Um, and it, e equally it has that for... Please, Sorry, go. Think, Please carry on. <coughs> Please continue. Okay. Um, and similarly, there are figures for the use of um, naval fuels and uh, fuels for ground vehicles. So 
those figures are published and then they're used as a basis to calculate um, the, the carbon emissions related to those fuels um, by the MOD. Um, there is proposals to start using what are called synthetic, uh, sorry, sustainable aviation fuels. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been trials. Um, there is a lot of controversy around these fuels, particularly the degree to which they save emissions um, and whether the life cycle impacts are sufficiently included in um, estimates of how much emissions they save. So that's one element of the debate. Um, another element of the debate is where the fuels are sourced. There are different types of fuels. Um, so they can be sourced from waste materials, but the trouble with that one is that the supplies of waste um, biofuels um, is pretty much all used up globally um, because the automotive industry, the automotive sector uses it um, mm. as, a, as a drop in fuel for cars. Um, so there isn't much left over for, um, for aviation to use. And again, it, it becomes a competition who can, play, uh, who, who can pay the most for that fuel. Then you've got the possibility of, of getting it from virgin material, but if you get it from energy crops, then you come into land use conflict between with food crops. So the, the industry is trying to move away from them. And then you, you move to um, um, what's called second generation fuels, um, which are, are harder to produce, more expensive to produce. The resource is uncertain. Um, there are technical obstacles to producing it. It certainly won't be produced in, in large quantities. So, uh, just, just to save time, so, so, I, so, so I think what you're yeah. telling the committee is that there's a lot of research work going on in, this, in these areas. But, you know, if you're flying a fast jet in mm. combat and people are trying to kill you, mm. you know, you're going to want, you know, if you hit the afterburner, you're going to want a full-throated response for obvious mm. operational reasons. So is there any actual hard evidence of, of fuel substitution in any of the three services? Has anybody actually started using a different fuel that's more environmentally friendly? Or in all three services, is this still very much at the research stage? This is genuinely at the research stage. We're right. starting to see some, I mean, the, the, the MOD has approved <coughs> fuel standards which include up to 50% of um, biofuels within aviation fuel, for example, yeah. but the resource isn't there. Um, so, and, and it's only been tested, to my knowledge, not in fast jets, but um, I think the last test was a Voyager flight. So, transport, cargo transport, but not um, not for combat aviation. So, I think that's another step as well. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, uh, Mark, Sarah. Thank you, Chair. Um, morning, both. Just to pick up on a point that Mark's just mentioned, defence to be operationally effective right now is a high carbon user. And I just only hope that the MOD are making objective, robust climate assumptions for the future. But I want to pick up on um, the MOD's emission targets. And I know, Stuart, you've already mentioned some restrictions with the greening government commitment. But, Lindsay, do you want to say anything about those commitments, how they fit into defence, and if you've got any reflections or opinions? Yeah, well, the um, MOD's climate strategy that was published in 2021 um, sets out a commitment to contribute to the UK government's net zero um, goal for 2050. So it hasn't actually set a target itself for net zero, although this is where it gets a little bit confusing because the RAF have set a net zero goal um, for 2040, which from what we've just heard about the um, issues re relating to you know, sustainable fuels, biofuels or synthetic fuels, you know, that um, does seem fairly op very optimistic. Um, the, I'm not sure that the Navy have set one. Um, they have did refer to, in their written evidence to working towards a net zero, so I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, and I've not seen one, I'm not aware of one with respect to the army. Um, so with respect to actual targets, these aren't actually really being set. Um, DENS actually have also um, issued um, targets for 2040, I think it is. Um, but again, 
um, that's to do with operations and infrastructure. So I'm not quite sure how that includes its supply chain. So, you know, it shouldn't be this confusing. I think this is the point. It should be much clearer, clearly set out. Um, what are targets? Are there targets? What are those targets? Do they cover certain TLBs or do they cover the whole MOD? Okay, thank, thank you. So the MOD have declared G, GC uh, measured emission targets and actually it seems to be doing very well very quickly because the targets are to be achieved by 2025. So for overall uh, emission reductions it's 30%. They've already achieved 29%. Direct emissions was 10, they've achieved 8. Travel was 30, they've achieved 27. And business flights was a 30% target, and they've actually reduced it by 62, which we think that's probably due to COVID. So are these targets ambitious enough, or are they quite realistic given the current climate we're in and we do have a war on the fringes of Europe? Uh, Stuart? I think, I think those targets are very narrow, um, and I think this is what... What we're trying to get to is is the targets and the measuring don't easily match up with each other. The targets only apply to very narrow sections of the organisation. Um, so we have, for example, um, emissions data on the whole of the estate. We have emissions data on the whole of um, equipment capability. Um, the those data are broken down into UK and overseas, um, and um, and then we have a, a bit of further data on um, things like um, you know business travel uh, um, and some new data that just published about families, family accommodation. Um, so we're we're starting to get a picture here, but. But then we're starting to hear targets being set for small parts of that. So the Greening government targets are only applied to the estate. Um, the RAF target only applies to the RAF, but it doesn't. But that includes part of the estate. What we would like to see are targets, or at least some indication, some indication of what the total RAF emissions are, so that we can see what a, a net zero target would actually require. And I think you, you can't can't take clear action and know how well you're doing and where, unless you have clear emissions data to track that. Um, okay, Lindsay. And, and again, oh, sorry, go on, go on, Stuart. I, I was just going to say that, and the, the Green Government targets only apply to the estate, they don't apply to mm. capability emissions, and that's two thirds of what's called scope one and scope two emissions, which are the kind of the core emissions, which we would expect, um, well, any, any comparable organisation would have targets for the whole of the organisation um, and would either have annual targets or five-year budget targets and, and you would be able to track that. that that's sort of standard practice um, that many climate-leading organisations are doing and others are moving towards. And so without that, that clear target setting, we're starting to see it on estates, but we're not seeing very much beyond that. And, and supply chain, there's very little at all. Again, we need some data on what those those emissions are um, and how those are measured. And that's going to take a bit of research. And again, and, and then the war fighting emissions themselves, um, which, which methodologies don't exist at the moment. Thank you, Stuart. Anything to add, Lindsay? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm probably, I'm just going to, I wanted to touch on, you know, the fact that it's, um, the big supply chain, you know, the MOD, therefore all this kind of understanding of what the emissions are locked in with other things are, are obviously very difficult. But I just wanted to um, highlight about um, what other, um, what is happening across other very large organisations. So the NHS, so the NHS has got, a, you know, social and social care and healthcare budgets is about, what, four times as big as the MOD budget, but they're still um, taking the steps for um, much better reporting, including their supply chain. So they've all already made an estimate of their carbon footprint, where they call it um, carbon footprint plus, I think. So they've made that estimate. Um, so if it can be done by organisations as large as the NHS in England, then it's no reason why the MOD cannot do the same as well. Okay, thank you both. Thanks. Sarah, thank you. Uh, let's 
step back and look internationally. Uh, Emma. Thanks, Chair. Morning, both. I think this question is probably best directed to yourself first, Dr Parkinson. Is there any international best practice for military emissions reporting? Um, in general, there isn't. Um, NATO have said that they are publishing a framework, or they have produced a framework, but they haven't yet put it into the public domain, and we would urge them to do so, so that we have some idea of what they're saying. Um, Lindsay can speak to the um, best practice guidance that she has put together last year. Um, and um, I mean, as I say, it's worth reiterating that the reporting under the UN Framework Convention has many flaws and we would urge um, that to be improved. Um, the MOD in general is publishing more emissions data than, than most militaries. Um, so, and they're kind of in the leading group of, of militaries in terms of how much data they're publishing. But as I've said, there are still problems with what is published and what where targets are being set, and, and you have to have the two matched up. Otherwise, it, your, your, your emissions data is not being utilised to help you set the targets, and you're not able to track how well you're doing against those targets. Okay. Lindsay, did you want to come in there? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, just to reiterate about the, um, how useful, terribly useful it would be if NATO published their um, guidance that they developed and published in 2022, well, issued to members apparently in 2022, because um, they said they were going to do this back in um, 2021. So it was like, we were like, oh, great, this will be, you know, help to inform and instruct other militaries as to is what is good practice. But um, as you know, we've not seen that. So we did develop this framework to kind of set out what we think are the key emissions, because I think that's one of the um, big problems is that when you talk about military emissions, people <laughs> just talk about fuel use, but there's this whole host of other emissions. And as I mentioned earlier about the whole indirect emissions um, linked to not just their supply chain, but also linked to actually when a conflict may take place. Um, so it's important to, um, understand when militaries are reporting or what does that cover what does that what does that entail and what's being missed and what can they not yet report because it's just a bit too well it's too difficult to do but it doesn't mean you don't acknowledge that that's an element that you haven't been able to quantify and you can make some kind of estimates if not at that stage or say that this will be done at a later date but you know we know there's much more research needed to do this but it's so important um, and the UK government because they're taking you know because they're ahead of others with respect to the reporting we're doing in-house and the kind of structures and the policies that are already in place, they can take this lead and um, ask of NATO to publish, publicise this so that other militaries, not just um, NATO members, can also see and um, take steps to do the same. Um, we need to see those improvements, as um, Stuart mentioned, about the UN um, report, reporting to the UN. So it's not just what reporting is... Um, delivered by governments, but the whole framework and what the UN are asking for, you know, they shouldn't just be asking for fuel use, they should be, it, the, the categories for military emissions should be much broader, because at the moment it does properly allow us to understand the impact and that they have on the, on the climate. Um, and then the other thing is um, NATO are setting up, um, are in the process and Canada will be hosting, and I'm not sure when it's due to be launched, is the Centre for Excellence on um, climate and the environment so you know with that in place as well it's just even more important now more than ever to push this and the UK government UK MOD can be part of pushing that forward. Okay. Thanks for that and I was just wondering where does the UK armed forces sit in relation to other militaries in terms of our missions targets and climate change initiatives so where would we rank compared to elsewhere? It is very difficult to provide a ranking when there's such poor data out there. Um, I mean, in, in terms of, in, in, uh, for example, um, the US military has published strategy reports um, in the open literature for their Air Force, Navy and Army. And um, these include a set of plans, um, a set of targets. Um, we think the targets are quite weak and, and have various loopholes. But at least they're there and you can see what they are and see what they're agreed to and committed to and are doing and and, um, and where flaws might be. Whereas in the UK, we haven't done that yet. 
and that it would be good to see that. Um, some other European militaries are taking some action. I, I haven't seen detailed plans, but at least their their emissions reporting is better, and and, and they say they're they're starting to take action. So Norway, Denmark, Luxembourg, France, and Germany have all been various high, uh, highlighted as, as doing action in this area. So I think in, in terms of acknowledging the problem, basic strategy documents, improvements in emissions reporting and, and starting to make targets, there, there's a leading group of which UK is a part. But um, it, it really is, it, it, it's hard to talk about leadership when they're so far behind the commercial sector um, and, and other government um, departments um, in terms of, of just a, a robust um, counting of emissions. So um, yeah, that's, that's a problem. And, and yeah, and, and this is the thing, globally it's much worse. Okay, Lindsay, did you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I would, I would say that um, I think the M the UK MOD, um, you know, have a fairly decent track record in establishing environmental initiatives. So, you know, there's there's looking at um, energy efficiency in buildings, for example, um, and they they for new builds, the defence related environmental assessment methodology and things like that, um, environmental protection policy. You know, th there's lots of systems in place, and they've been doing a lot on environmental protection across the estate. Um, and their operations on their assets and also um, on land quality. Um, you know, they've had a framework set up for many, many years since the mid 90s on looking at their contaminated land framework and their liabilities associated with contaminated land. And when you think the MOD own around about 1% of the UK land, you know, that's quite a lot of liabilities, especially when you think of all the historic activities that have happened on um, MOD land. So um, my point is that the, they've had They've got procedures in place and they have a history of being able to um, meet these difficult challenges with respect to environmental issues and take steps to to manage that um, something like um, you know the you know contaminated land obviously is very different from the global issues of climate um, but it still means that you um, are having to work across TLBs to um, the the, the different organisations within the MOD to understand what the environmental liabilities are with that contaminated land. So I think that's, you know, it means that they can step up and they can do it because they've um, put other frameworks in, in place and have been running with frameworks. But, you know, they need to have the resourcing behind it so they'd be able to deliver this. Thanks. Uh, Richard, were you wanting to come in or you're right? No? No, no, okay. just... Um, uh, Robert, please. Thank you, uh, Chet. So we've talked about uh, the uh, measuring uh, and targets perspective from a military perspective. Um, I wanted to just ask from a slightly broader perspective as to whether there are any best practice examples um, on what organisations that you would regard as being climate leading in any event, whether they're in the military sphere or any other, um, what are those climate leading organisations doing in terms of uh, measuring, in terms of reporting, and in terms of target setting? Yeah, um the, the first thing, the, well, the most widely used scheme, and it's becoming uh, more of a standard, is something called the Science-Based Targets Initiative. So they, um, organizations can sign up with this um, international body. It helps them set targets that are compatible with either well below two degrees or, or 1.5 degree pathways that lead to net zero. Um, and so you're, you're getting a, um, a number of, of large companies signing up and you're even getting some military technologies who are starting the process, even if they uh, haven't got to the point of, of uh, uh, having a, uh, an approved certified um, net zero target. Um, within this process, it, it kind of, the, these targets are intended to be compatible with hitting um, 1.5 or two degrees. And, and that sort of implies things of, of total scope one, scope two emissions falling by about 4% per year. Um, the carbon offsets being limited to um, 5 to 10% of their, their baseline emissions um, and external validation and, and, and certification. So these are, these are really quite stringent targets. Um, and it you know, be great if the MOD could sign up to, to something like this, but I suspect you will find it 
very difficult, but um, at least moving towards that direction um, as rapidly as you can would, would be something that, that, I would argue, is your aim. That's where you should be. Um, if you can hit, hit maybe you can uh, get to the point of reaching <coughs> the targets, then um, that, would, that would be um, a change indeed. That's very helpful, Joe. Thank you. And Lizzie? Um, yeah, I'm going to go back to my um, example of the NHS, I'm afraid, um, but just to re re reiterate about it. Um, so you had the Health and Care Act of 2022, which placed a duty on trusts and care bodies, etc., to to um, commit to making a contribution to um, the net zero. Um, so it, as, and that has kind of meant that, you know, helped to lead the way with respect to the road mapping for the health service to reduce its carbon emissions. So they've set some really clear targets, actually. So I'll, I'll just read some of these out. So from April 2022, all NHS procurements require a minimum 10% net zero and social value weighting. Can I just pause there just to show I understand it? This is a, there's a granularity of targets that you're pointing to. Yes, right? I mean, yes, you say is. they've got their targets, but your point they've is... Not they've not got them. Yeah, so the, the NHS have, have set these out. Yeah. So from this April 2023, all contracts above 5 million require this um, carbon reduction plan. So the MOD are doing that as well. Okay, so that's tick, tick there as well. Um, April 2024, um, that was going to reply, apply to all contracts, so not just ones which are £5 million pounds and over per year. So from April 2027, all suppliers will be required to publicly report their targets and emissions and publish a carbon, carbon reduction plan. Um, and that includes all of their, so all their supply chain scopes one, two and three. Um, and then from April 28, um, all individual products to the NHS will have to be carbon footprinted. Um, and then from 2030, all suppliers will only be will only qualify for NHS contracts if they demonstrate their progress through published progress reports, etc. Mm. So that's to just give you a flavour of kind of what their what others their do and a good way of doing it. And then um, a completely well, separate but slightly different example. Um, I just wanted to say about the humanitarian sector, you know, MOD is saying, oh, you know, it's not our core business, that, that might be one of the excuses why it's not been prioritised before. Um, but thinking about, you know, how the humanitarian sector are stepping up to this as well. So the um, International Committee for the Red Cross, they've um, had for a, a year or two now a charter that over 300 organisations, humanitarian organisations have signed up to, um, committing to tackle their um, environmental impacts of their operations when they go and provide humanitarian support and aid um, and this month the International Committee of Red Cross um, issued a carbon calculator tool to help all these organizations to estimate their carbon emissions and that includes all scope one two and three um, emissions as well looking at the supply chain of to the humanitarian sector so if they can do it um, there is no excuses why it cannot be done, and it needs to be done fast. You know, when we know within the um, MOD climate strategy, we've got um, its phrases EPOC one, two, and three. And yeah. I know a lot of these things with respect to baselining are covered within EPOC one, so that's up until twenty twenty five. I think it is EPOC one, the first phase. So this, you know, it's just making sure that the it's the pressure is still on to ensure that the MOD do meet these um, targets. Was it, targets with respect to the EPOC targets, I don't mean climate reduction targets, you know, to get that baseline done and to start understanding what the actual um, overall carbon footprint is itself. Thank you, Robert. Uh, oh, thank sorry. you. Sorry, I was going to mention one other thing. Yeah, please do. Okay. okay. Um, and then also um, thinking about, because I, I kind of, I was having a look at, um, it, you know, it's accessible, you can go into the um, Knowledge and Defence portal and have a look at the um, um, policies and standards across the MOD and looking to see what kind of um, uh, requirements are respect to um, procurement policy and carbon reduction requirements in that. And the policies are there um, and they've been updated recently, a um, few of them were updated last year, um, which is which is very good of course and welcome, but the, it's the requirements in there are very qualitative and they're not kind of matching against a target because obviously there isn't a target and there isn't a carbon budget within the MOD. So how do you quantify what is significant with respect to a, um, 
a carbon reduction of a supplier or a product if you don't know what the carbon budget of the MOD is. So um, guidance is out there for other organisations, for example, um, national highways when they're building big road structures, um, bridges, etc. You know, they've got a um, requirement um, because obviously a lot of their structures and projects need to fall under the environmental impact assessment regulations. Um, which requires looking at climate as well and climate um, and greenhouse gas emissions. So there is guidance there on how you actually look and quantify and the, the significance of the greenhouse gas emissions relating to a project. So there are there is other guidance been issued and <clears throat> the same within the MOD. Thank you very much. Richard. Just to quickly to butt into you both, um, you both talked an awful lot about targets. Uh, I just wonder where they fit into the military's ability to fight a war. This is a difficulty. Um, I think... I say that, sorry, I say that because we face, uh, we hope not, a war. We see a war in Europe. It could spread possibly to the West. We hope not, of course. Uh, I would have thought that carbon emissions will go to the roof now as fighters take to the sky, ships to the sea and exercises all over Europe are taken to counter any possible threat. So where do your targets fit in, as I've said, to the military's ability to fight a war? Yes, well, you may have a target, you may not reach that target, but you need to know whether you can reach it or not. There's no point just ignoring the problem. It is a problem. You may not be able to get there, but that means that another sector is going to have to work a lot harder somewhere else to meet our overall carbon budget. You know, at the moment, we don't. Our whole point about the reporting and the understanding of what the overall footprints are is not there. So you need to know so you can make informed decisions about future military strategy, future military spending. At the moment, those decisions aren't based on the impact it has on greenhouse gas emissions because the data is not there. So you need to have an informed choice so that you can decide whether that's what you want or whether it affects your military strategy. That's what I would say. Lindsay, can I come back to you on the data? The data's not there. It's not the data, it's not the data we need. It's the, uh, the fuel, I would suggest. Uh, we don't have an alternative right now to fossil fuel. People are working very hard to reduce carbon emissions, but right now we don't have it. And until we do, and it works, and it's affordable, and every country in NATO can use it, and every aircraft and ship and mankind and so forth can actually benefit from it, it's unlikely to be university rolled out. So the future is surely looking for this technology. But until then, we are going to have but to... But you, you, don't, you don't not measure it before you know you can solve the problem. You need to measure it from the beginning to know where you're going to get to and how you're going to get there. You can't be blinkered about the solution um, without knowing what the problem is. I mean, you need to know what the problem is to sort out the solution. So you need to know how big the problem is. So you need to start measuring reporting properly now so that you can scale as to where you are above or below that target it may be it may be an unachievable target but you'll know where you are with it and you can make that as i said informed decision of where you want to be dr parkinson do you want to add anything to that yes um i mean it it's important to know what military emissions are so if the argument goes that okay the military can't reduce their emissions this year for whatever reason like being in a war um then civilian society needs to reduce more to compensate so there are a number of ways of doing that and that can be done centrally through government through increasing the targets for the civilian sector or it could be done through an emissions trading scheme that the mod that the uk has an emissions trading scheme the MOD or parts of the MOD could join that and it then there would be a trade around emission credits and that would have the knock-on effect of encouraging civilian sectors to do more to compensate for what the military is doing. So there are there are ways to include it. There, there's also the issue of budgeting if you have a five-year budget period and your emissions on average over that period have to reach a certain level and you have um, increased emissions in one or two years, then averaging out will allow you to um, be closer to the target. So, yeah, again, there are ways of dealing with it. And it, and it also, but I, I don't want to be trite about this, and I'm, I'm very aware of, of the bigger 
the problems at the moment. But we do, we do need to make sure that we do properly fund diplomacy, overseas aid, and, and those soft for, um, areas to try and reduce the possibilities of, of, of conflicts becoming armed um, and becoming um, okay. yeah, diplomatic conflicts thank getting you, worse. Jim. Richard, thank you for that. Uh, Gavin. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms. Cottrell, I wonder if I could come back to you because I think you've, you've helpfully outlined how our Ministry of Defence is benchmarked internationally uh, and you've indicated how the areas within the MOD, the different armed services, have a different approach to targets. Royal Navy, I think you had indicated you're not quite sure what they mean by working toward net zero, but they have something, whereas uh, uh, with the Army uh, it's not so clear. But having looked at the Defence Knowledge Portal, who within Defence is doing really well? We don't know. At all? <laughs> We don't know because the reporting isn't um, disaggregated like that. Okay, and you haven't picked up anything anecdotally. Or? The only the only thing I could say well, probably is from looking at the Defence Safety Authority annual review reviews is that it looked like the Navy was struggling with respect, and I'm talking about overall environmental protection issues. And again, that was down. You know, for the, it was highlighted about resourcing there. Uh, and just reiterate the point I made before about, you know, you're not going to deliver any of this if you don't provide the proper resources for the military to step up, train its staff and provide, get the specialism in there to do it and make sure that the, you know, data collection, the auditing and the verification is there with respect to um, and the... Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Parkinson, anything further to add on that? Are you aware of anybody exceeding their targets I mean, it, are excelling in the endeavour. It, it's good to see that the RAF have got a, a net zero target before 2050, um, but and and they have some <coughs> idea of some of the things they are going to do to get to that target. But that target is very dependent on fuels <laughs> being available in sufficient quantity, alternative fuels being available in sufficient quantity by that time, which there is a huge question mark over so it's the target isn't very credible until you have intermediate steps in and, and again if you don't have the emissions um, the, the emissions reporting at the moment um, so that we don't know what the Air Force's emissions are then then that target looks shaky can, can I can I just add another thing as well I'm sorry um, we keep on going on obviously about reporting and um, you know the MOD are doing annual reporting and it does include sustainability <coughs> reporting and greenhouse gas emissions um, but it's it's unfortunate because I think the quality the, the, the kind of detail I won't say quality I'll say the detail of that reporting over the last few years I would say has gone down what's in the public domain um, back in 2009 um, when I think it was the first MOD sustainable sustainability report that was independently verified. I don't think one's been independently verified since. And since then, I think the last, at the moment, it's now aggregated into the annual report, which in a way is a good thing because it should sit there. It is part of the whole the way the MOD operates. Sustainability should be embedded in there, but it does mean that there's no detail anymore. And it's and, and there's it, the, the, the amount of detail isn't enough. I don't think. There used to be separate reports up until about, 20, I think the last one was in 2017. Um, so you know, it's just unfortunate that that kind of level of reporting seems to have, that's in the public domain, seems to have gone down in the last few years than it used to be. And I think that could be, um, that could change. Hopefully okay. it's better. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, uh, Lindsay, um, what lessons can be learned from UK military efforts to reduce emissions to date? I mean... What's the best example you can give this committee of a significant reduction in emissions by the Ministry of Defence? Um, I can give you some examples. Um, there is, to, to, firstly to explain, there is some data on some military emissions that goes back to 1990. Right. So, for example, the under the UN, um, under the national statistics on climate, there is data on military aviation and shipping fuel use. It goes back to 1990. 
Now that data shows um, the, the, I mean, the, the most, the most striking um, uh, uh, conclusion from looking at that data is that military missions fall most during periods of peace and periods of military spending reductions, um, which you possibly <laughs> don't want to hear, but that's, that is when you get the big reductions. Right. Um, I, mean, I would just England, remind you this committee has campaigned for years to increase defence spending to 3% of gross domestic product. I'll just throw that in there. Yes. <laughs> um, of the reductions between, it, again using this data set, of the reductions between 2010 and 2020, 80% um, of those reductions occurred between 2010 and 2015, and again that's when military spending was falling. And 20% of those reductions occurred between 2019 and 20, and that was due to COVID. So, at the moment, there isn't much evidence that actions to reduce um, um, aviation fuel use, um, uh, aviation and shipping fuel use, has reduced carbon emissions. Well, I mean, um, it's not much. terribly surprising that during a lockdown, military emissions might reduce. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think we're kind of stunned by that uh, but is there one particular program or initiative that the MOD have undertaken in recent years that has significantly reduced their emissions you know in any particular area of MOD activity that you can point to or, 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 or that perhaps Lindsay can you know, no. does the MOD have a poster child for emission reductions as it were no no Lindsay is there, there is. anything that you okay fine Lindsay, is there yeah. anything else? If, if, if your answer's no, we'll move on. Um, I, I would like to just point out, because what the data, the, the data that's re been reported over the last 10 years, between 10, 2010 and 2020, shows reductions in military emissions of 54%, and that's widely quoted in the MODs, you know, that's great. Um, and the four biggest reasons from my analysis of looking at this is I've already said about spending cuts, reductions in military personnel. The other big one is decarbonisation of the national grid, which is being done obviously by civilian um, organisations, electricity generators. That's made a big difference to um, the carbon emissions from electricity use of MOD buildings. But again, it's not by the MOD. So the big, the four biggest reasons why um, military emissions have fallen over the past 10 years have not been due to MOD action but or not from, been due to intentional MOD action. Okay, for, from, sorry, Lindsay, you've been very patient. But, you know, from, from what you're saying, the biggest overall reason for the reduction in emissions by the Ministry of Defence over the last decade or so is because there's been a, sig a significant shrinkage in the size of the armed forces, so there's been a lot fewer people emitting, right? Right, okay. Lindsay, is there anything you want to add on that? Not really. I think that says it's all, you know, it's... You've had disposals of the estate as well, of course, which reduces the size of um, emissions as well. Um, and there are, you know, there are an energy efficiency initiatives across the MOD, you know, as I mentioned before about, you know, looking at um, new builds and there's, there's a whole host of sustainability um, criteria and assessment tools for ensuring that projects are, you know, look at um, the whole aspects of a new build with respect to its environmental impact and its sustainability. <coughs> so, you know, those initiatives that are all in place, but directly how they've contributed to great reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, okay, I mean, you could extrapolate and say that if you wanted to reduce military emissions virtually to zero, you could abolish the armed forces, but it could be argued there might be some policy knock-ons from that. Absolutely, yes, there would. Like, you know, the end of freedom and democracy and stuff like that. What, what, we're, what we're, you know, we, I'm reiterating again, is that informed decisions, so the government and, and society completely understands where the... Um, these carbon budget sits under which government departments and the decisions are made about any procurement, whether that's energy <coughs> procurement or health service procurement or education procurement, is those decisions can be based not only on social economic value, but also um, 
how it impacts the climate and what the greenhouse gas emissions are mm. attributed to that. It should I mean, be just, just quickly, I mean, would you agree that nuclear war would be bad for the environment? Absolutely. OK, yes. good. I thought be important to get that on the record. Thanks, Jim. Um, just to be uh, rather uh, curious uh, line of questioning from, from Mark there, but there's a serious aspect of I'm this. sorry, I wasn't curious at all. <laughs> well, I'm curious because there is a dilemma that we face here. I'm looking at the um, economic forum, World Economic Forum's global risk uh, ranks, and as you mentioned earlier, you know the first five are all linked to climate change. So failure to mitigate climate change, failure to cli of, of climate change adaptation, natural disasters, extreme weather patterns, biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, large-scale involuntary migration, natural resource crises. These all point to the fact that they we're going to place ever greater burden on security and indeed by extension the duties, the requirements, the obligations that we're going to place on our armed forces um, in order to, to mitigate, to, to meet the challenges that are coming over the horizon. Um, my question is, is, that, is should, should there be an acceptance perhaps that whilst we chase quite rightly a net zero target at 2050, the net zero, the net part of that, is the fact that that's our overall ambitions. Perhaps there needs to be a latitude given to our armed forces um, to acknowledge that they will not be able to necessarily meet those targets in full, given the threats that are coming over the horizon and the timescale that we face. We're not going to, going to Richard's point, have the replacement fuels um, that are going to be able to allow our military to be net zero, but we could still meet our net zero targets as a country. Would you concur? Stuart? It's the, there is a question to be asked about what is the reasonable size of the military in a climate constrained world. And that is related to the level of consumption of resources <clears throat> that a country um, has and whether we have um, a lot of um, luxury consumption, for example, that then relies on insecure supply chains, which then the military is called on to secure, um, and whether it's better to reduce that consumption at home so that we don't need such a large military to try and secure those supply chains. There are, there are much wider questions about the type of society that is sustainable in a climate-constrained world. and and. The size of the military that you have is related to that question, and, and it's, a, it's a big question, <laughs> and, and I don't think we have time to go into it today. So it's, yeah, I, I think that that is a, a question that needs to be considered across government um, with input from, from the, the military as well. Um, about it, goes to, it goes to the heart as to why I wanted us to study this particular subject. Mm because I do believe that the insecurity caused by climate change of the next 10 to 20 years, or indeed the next couple of years, is going to be so significant that we've not, we've not, uh, we're not bracing ourselves, we're not anticipating, we're, we're still in denial as to uh, the, the, the scale of, of difficulties uh, to global security, um, particularly when you have countries such as uh, Russia and China, and to some degree India, not meeting their climate change targets meaning that we're not going to meet our overall ambitions uh, according to the Paris Agreement. Um, Lindsay, do you have any comment on this? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you with respect. We yeah. can't be in denial at all. But we can't also be, <laughs> I'm banging the same message, we can't also be in denial in what contribution the military also makes to that so that um, it's understood, decisions are based on the right decisions, and that includes decisions on what the climate impact will be on that additional military expend expenditure or whether you want it to be um, compensated for elsewhere in society. Yeah, okay, thank so that's you. Why we, that's why we want to reiterate the importance of understanding what the yeah. um, footprint of the military is. Um, Derek, did you want to come in? Yeah, just, uh, just briefly, uh, it's, it's a little bit following on from, from, from Richard's and uh, Mark's really comments. Um, I've heard various comments you've made which relate to we've got to have targets even though the long lake has been met, uh, yes there are problems, uh, the size of the uh, 
of the armed forces is, is a question that needs to be also looked at in terms of climate change and so on. Um, so I, I just wondered, and I sort of, in terms of the size of the armed forces and its impact on climate change, wouldn't any government, in terms of because its first duty is security of the country, decide what size the armed forces are? It's purely based on what's the needs of the security of the country and defending the country, not the climate change. Um, the, the other part of the question I suppose I've got is that um, the, 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 the bottom line is I don't think, for instance, the Russians will be spending too much resource on dealing with the climate change issues that arise out of the, the work of the armed forces. So why should the British armed forces, and so in terms of the fighting, the war machine fighting part of it, <coughs> be spending scarce resources on that side of things? I, th I mean, your comparison with Russia is interesting because one of the arguments around the vulnerabilities, if you look at countries which are vulnerable to climate change, Russia has the world's largest area to deal with. The permafrost is melting. It's, it, it's got a lot of infrastructure based on that permafrost. It, the, its military could spend an awful lot of time trying to respond to disasters um, and wildfires in northern Russia, defending a far lo longer coastline because of ice cap melting. Um, in, in China, there's flooding is going to be a major issue. And you're, you're going to see militaries being drawn more and more into disaster relief rather than um, where they have been war fighting capability before, which is going to stretch everybody. And, and that's and that's an argument you can make to those countries and governments at an international level is that we all need to step up and do a lot more and the, and the I, military I, action is part of that. I think, I think there's a difference, sorry Chair, I think there's a difference between what the country as a whole should be doing, uh, in other words the policy of a country or, or a group of countries, nations, to combat climate change, which I'm sure we're all on board with. The issue I'm trying to sort of get to in the world is why why should so much pressure be put on the actual military to try and deliver on climate change when actually its prime aim is war fighting or certainly defence and security of the country uh, and its resources are scarce and the basis of the, certainly the size of the armed forces has got to be completely based on the needs of security. That's got to be the first priority, hasn't it? So what happens in terms of the general policy of the country or countries in terms of climate change is one thing and, and probably all on, I'm sure we're all on board with that. But actually trying to commit much-needed resources uh, that are scarce already in, say, our armed forces, when we know certainly the Russians will be doing that, uh, why put the pressure on our armed forces when, when resources are so scarce anyway? Uh, Lindsay, do you want to come in? Uh, yeah, I'll come in. Um, because you, you've got no choice <laughs> in the fact that it's not just... Um, it's not just us saying this. You've got, you know... the. <clears throat> Within the MOD, they're also talking about energy security as well. Mm. So, you know, the added benefit from that obviously is um, reduced carbon emissions. If you, but you know, why is the military so important? Is because the military contributes so much. You know, the estimate with respect to central government, it's fifty percent, but more than that of central government's greenhouse gas emissions. So they contribute a lot. They're hugely dependent on fossil fuel at the moment. And a lot of the initial discussions about energy efficiency and et cetera is actually linked with um, security of supply in the in in theatre, so that when you're operating, you can um, secure your fuel logistics supply. Um, it's much more; it will be better, and you're more resilient as an operating um, military if you can rely on renewables, um, so you don't have to rely on a vulnerable fuel supply chain. So, in that sense there's a reason why you should be doing it. And then you've got the added benefit that you're, going, you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions as well. I don't really want to use that as an argument because obviously my position is that it's really <coughs> good we, as, a whole, as a whole society, we need to look at every single aspect of our society and see how and where those um, reductions can be made because we are in, it is that critical, you know, the science is there, we know we need to act and we know we need, we need to act as a whole, as a society, quickly. <coughs> and that means including the military, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, I, mean, yeah, sorry, I mean, Dr. Parkinson made a point that the Russian armed forces, which are large, you know, could play a valuable role in, for instance, in disaster relief. 
and potentially, in, and he said they could spend a lot of time doing that, and that's theoretically true. Unfortunately, at the moment, they're spending rather a lot of time blowing innocent civilians in Ukraine to pieces, aren't they? So I think we should just appreciate the reality, in military terms, <coughs> of what's actually going on in front of our eyes, shouldn't we? I, I'm not going to dispute that. <laughs> so you're not going to do that? You, you, not I, I'm, 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 not, yeah. I'm not disputing that we shouldn't take account of what's going on on the ground um, in any okay. particular war, but I think there are more things that we can do globally. I mean, the, you know, the Ukraine situation is, is very difficult, obviously, um, but if we had taken more notice of to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, as um, people like Lutz have been arguing um, in the in the um, years running up to this conflict, we would have been in a much more secure position in terms of, of not having to experience such um, fast rises in food, um, energy prices. Well, food the, the Ukrainians did that, you know, by investing heavily in nuclear energy, but unfortunately, a lot of those nuclear energy plants have now been overrun by the Russians, haven't they? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're wandering into to Ukraine, which is important. You make an important point, though, on security of supply. And yes, it would be a lot different had we weaned ourselves off uh, Russian uh, energy uh, requirements. Um, Robert, do you want to wrap us up? Sorry. No, thank you. Uh, so Sorry, what... No. Lindsay, were you saying something? No, I, yeah, I was just going to kind of interject, kind of, if you kind of forget the military aspect, you know, this is the, this is the kind of conversation that was happening, you know, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years ago about, you know, when the UK the Climate Act, um, you know, should be the UK be taking a lead on climate change when no one else is, um, and look what the mess we're in now. Um, so yes, we do have to take the lead, and that includes now making sure that the military included within that. So I don't think we're, we're. I don't think the the consensus here isn't that we're arguing for that. Any efforts to be able to reduce the carbon footprint of the yeah. armed forces, I think, would be welcome. I think the message that I'm picking up here, which is again why we're highlighting this issue, is that whilst you're chasing net zero, so you end up with net zero, there has to be. Uh, an exemption to some degree for the military that may be, have to exceed net zero because of the very insecurity that the wider implications of climate change is going to bring around. There will be more insecurity because of climate change, therefore necessitating greater utility of our armed forces. I think that's perhaps the, the argument that, 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 that's being made. But we're going to get differences of opinion uh, on, on this matter. Um, if that's okay, we'll ask Robert to continue. Thanks. It was on a link point, really. I mean, to what extent can we expect technological advances uh, to fill the gap so that uh, military can benefit from technological advances uh, in the uh, route uh, to uh, net zero and reducing carbon emissions? And to the extent that they can't, is this where we just have to accept that they'll do a certain amount of good, but then we just have to accept we need properly equipped uh, military that can do what we need them to do? Can I go first, Lindsay? Yeah. yeah, I think you've touched on that already, haven't you, Stuart? But, yeah. Yes, I mean, there, there are certain elements that are re relatively straightforward and, and the technology is clear. So um, things like building energy efficiency improvements, there are a lot of old buildings used by the military in the UK and, and improving the efficiency of those insulation, installing heat pumps to electrify heat would go a long way to reducing those emissions um, and particularly uh, as that's being pushed in or starting to be pushed it really should have been pushed much faster and much earlier in in the um, civilian sector that can be built upon and and could be done <coughs> um, there's also the issue of on-site renewable energy generation <coughs> at military bases um, solar photovoltaics in particular, perhaps wind in certain cases, maybe biogas in certain cases. I, I know there, there's work already going on on these issues. Microgrids using battery storage. These are, are areas where they're, they're, there's established technology. Um, it's being more and more widely deployed. Mm. We arguably been slow in doing this across the economy and we need to speed up and the MOD could be part of that. So. Those are important. Um, I mean, think that 
some wider issues about um, increasing the resilience of civilian public services so that the military doesn't get called in so often to emergencies. It's, it's kind of an indirect way, but I think that's important. <coughs> Reducing that the demand. Need to appreciate actually. that. Sorry. But do you see a point where the technology will advance such that it replaces 100% uh, of defence's need? And this is what I'm getting at. Do you see yes, the technology I mean, will provide the solution and then we'll just carry on as we have before but with a different, cleaner, greener way of doing it? Or do you think that there's going to have to be... Uh, the difficulty is, and the point that everyone's been getting at, is you can't have a reduction of the ask, not in defence. I, I think it's very difficult. I think the, the technologies that are being talked about optimistically around things like biofuels, synthetic fuels, batteries, hydrogen, nuclear, all have um, issues that mean that it's not going to be as easy as some of their advocates um, um, claim. And I could talk about some of those problems if you, if you want me to go into a bit more detail. But, but yes, it's going to be difficult. Um, and it's not clear which of them might potentially, which of the options that are at an early stage of development might be rolled out more widely, um, might be widely used by the military, um, or, or whether the military can, can build upon what the civilian area is, is doing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if, we wanted, if you want to ask about particular fuels, I'm happy to give you um, any feedback that I, I'm aware of, but, yeah. I'll, I'll, um, Lindsay, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I'm kind of just thinking generally along kind of like other in initiatives across um, the MOD other than just necessarily technology. So I talked about before about uh, the standards that are out there and the policies that are available already and the kind of the screening tools, but looking at, you know, contract awards, it's the obvious one and proper weighting of greenhouse gas and carbon footprints with respect to contract awards like the NHS are doing, um, making sure that the new defence um, environmental protection regulator also um, includes greenhouse gas emission and also that it's effective and properly resourced. Um, I think it's under, e so under the EPOC 1, again, of the MOD climate strategy, um, they talked about um, this is a kind of the baseline for natural cap capital across the MOD estate. Um, and I mentioned before about the, you know, the 1% of the MOD land holdings. So that's 1% and also I think it's 38% of those are sites of special scientific interest. So, you know, how those, and only fifth, less than half of those are in a favorable condition. So, you know, how, how biodiversity and all the improvements that can be made across the MOD zone estate, you know, that could be a huge um, advantage, not just for, you know, the carbon sinks, but also general biodiversity and improvements from environmental de degradation of those triple SIs. Um, and then the other thing which came out, I think, from the Chris Skidmore review that was out this this month, which looked at um, governments um, meeting its net zero, um, and he gave a recommendation of about an office for net zero delivery, and it would be excellent to see the MOD included in, in that remit as well. Whether that could happen, I don't know, but I think that would be very good. Um, step to take. Okay, uh, is that right, Robert? Thank you. I mean, we are, I think, highlighting the, the huge dilemma that the military faces in, in as we, we try to meet our, our net zero targets and, and the overall requirement of our armed forces to provide the necessary defense in an ever dangerous uh, world. Can I thank uh, uh, Dr. Stuart Parkinson and uh, Lindsay Cottrell for your contributions today? It's, you've added uh, a lot of, of value and, and in, insight into this important uh, subject. So thank you very much indeed uh, to you and to my colleagues here today. That brings this uh, defence uh, session today to a conclusion. Order. Order. Thank you.